Yeah. Okay, I think okay, we're doing okay, good. Okay, um, I usually intro my guests. I don't know if I want to intro you. Just say you're. We don't need to intro you. Basically, the best friend you've ever had. Yeah. Through thick and thin. Uh huh. Uh, the same height. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for introing. All right, I'll intro you. Um, I hate doing this intro. Yeah, we're too close for you to intro me. I'm. I'm not gonna intro you. Let's yeah. just get to it. Weirdly though, like <laughs> Seth intros me, but it's like it's on his show and it's on TV. And I, I feel like when he does it, he's like, Ugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My next guest is you. You know, my next guest is from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> like, no shit, I was there. <laughs> every every guest, I'm just like, I'm sorry for this lame intro. Hold on one second. <laughs> and then now I'm just like, you know what? Fuck it. Last episode, no intro, guys. Yeah, but then when you listen back, you're probably like, man. For, I wish I had that intro. For the audio, I'll do it. And then for the video, it'll just kick it on. Do it when you're by yourself and you don't have to feel the, the weirdness of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like I should have done that for everyone. You could even do it after I leave the room. You got a single. You get you get filmmaking. <laughs> you get filmmaking. Film school buddies. By the way, Akiva was he, when he when I interviewed Akiva. Yeah. He, we spoke about how 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 good you are at editing, although not in physical editor. Yeah. And that also always amazed me. And I don't know if anyone's ever told you that ah. before. Well, that's very nice of Akiva and you. Uh, when I do it myself, as you may recall from our projects at NYU, yes, it's very sloppy. But if I have someone like Kiva Yorm or now many other professional editors that I've worked with that are super fast, and I can just be like, ooh, now cut there, and now do this, and like, I can see it very clearly. I know what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. I just haven't put in the 10,000 hours like at the keyboard. And it's also why like it was a huge deal forever to get into film school. Yeah. We were right on the edge of that. Right. Um, we both went to Tish for film, and that's mm -hmm. where we met. Um, I just took over hosting duties. Yeah, yeah. no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I knew this was happening. Go but ahead. like, even the year we got there, I remember them being like, "Hey, there's a video right. wing now." Yeah. And I remember us being like, "Whoa!" Like we loved film, and it clearly looked way better. Yeah. But for all the stuff I wanted to do, which was just like shoot a million sketches. Yeah. I remember being like, "Oh, so we can just shoot as many ideas as we come up with." Whereas in the film classes, it was like, hey, this is going to be expensive. Okay. And I didn't care if mine looked like trash. Yeah. I just wanted to get every idea in my head out. I know. I, <laughs> and you did. <laughs> I did a lot. I remember uh, Yorm came in. Yorm, when I talked to Yorm, Yorm said that he remember, he remembers you going home, Christmas break, or whenever you guys had linked up again after you had shot your things. Yeah. And he was like, I was floored at what Andy was doing. Because it was just these huge swings. And he was like, I remember something. He was like pissing on a wall or something. Oh, uh, yeah. That was in our class. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where the, the, I was pissing on a brick wall and the wall starts talking to me that's or something. That's what it was. Yeah. That's, yes, that's the one he was talking about. Oh, yeah. but it wasn't me. It was my roommate was the actor because I had to be in the booth because I was the TV. Yes video class where we were in the booth it was yeah it was it was live it was live editing yeah where you're calling your cuts yes. like it's snl yes that's right <laughs> that was a fun experience that was cool that's very unique not many people get to do that that's true i think we've talked about this before i feel like my experience there was a lot like it is everywhere which is at first glance it doesn't people think i'm not taking it seriously they think i'm fucking around it's too stupid it's too silly and then I just keep working, right? right? I mean, you're the same. We just yeah. have like, you just do this thing where it's like, if you know that you're making something you actually want to be making and you keep working, you keep working, you keep working, eventually most people are like, all right, well, I got to at least give them credit for working. Yeah. Which I, is not something everyone does. That's true. I, I don't know if we ever got there with our sight and sound professor. Maybe not. I don't know if she full, I, because co also comedy at that time it was <laughs> there was no comedy classes and everything right. went, and that I, I wonder is there comedy classes now? Do you know? I remember maybe our second year there. We I transferred in. You transferred in. Yes. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> there was a comedy writing class. Oh. And it was a a wonderful professor. It's this dude who used to write for that show Herman's Head. Yeah, that's right. And he was a super nice guy and was funny, and had good notes. And I was like, whoa, this is the first time. I'm actually having like a professional level conversation about comedy yeah. with, with someone in a school environment. Yeah. And that was my favorite class ever. Cause I would write, you know, he'd be like, okay, your, your homework is write Like, you know, 20 weekend update jokes. Oh, I didn't know. Or that. like write a monologue for a late night show or now write a episode of a sitcom that you make up. And I, you know, 
some of the stuff you write is terrible and some of it's good. I, I've, I'm so into like, <clears throat> especially for comedy, but I think for anyone making lots of stuff so that you can see what works for you and what doesn't work. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 And that's something we've talked about a lot over the years. For it's sure. like, Oh man, some of the stuff that at the time we were like, "Whoa, this is so funny," and then you watch it now and you're like, "Oh God, <laughs> it's so humiliating!" Like, why did we think this is funny? I still, I still feel like that about current things. I look back and I go, "Eh, yeah, right, right." I don't know comedy. It's hard to find comedy that age as well. That's true. Oh, I wanted to ask you this if you remember because I, this actually, I still think about this. It kind of changed. It changed how I saw uh, getting into a creative field, which is when you applied for Tish, you have to. Fill out, fill out your, you know, your application, but you have to send in a creative writing, uh, yeah. any kind of creative, <laughs> creative yeah. sample. Yeah. Do you remember what your creative sample was? Well, I had two. Yes. One was a rap. Uh huh. Uh, on a tape. On a cassette. Yeah. Correct. Which I, I can't say I remember fondly now, but I did. It was. <clears throat> was it professionally recorded? No, it was like my roommates at the time in Santa Cruz, which is where I was going my first two years. Yeah. Helped me record it. Um, my friends um, James and Alex, we were all living together, and we did quite a bit of the rapping. So, like, turntables, <laughs> microphone, you recorded all yeah, like that. Yeah, okay. like, put on that instrumental that I, like, I wrote a thing, did a couple takes. I was like, okay, that's the Was it one. about getting into NYU? There was a line in it about how I would like to get into NYU, yes, which is obviously the most cringy part. Is that real? Yes. Oh, yes. okay, you were pandering. Fantastic. Full pander, yeah. yeah. It's like, I can, I can do a... I can work the room. <laughs> that's, that's the beginning of learning how to work the room. <laughs> yeah, like, this is probably what they want to hear. I didn't imagine the people in the admissions department were like super deep into hip hop so that I wanted it to be something they could understand. Uh, and then the other thing was a writing sample, which was just insane, which was James Bond's diary entries. But it was like, <clears throat> it, it, the format of it was diary entries. Yeah. <clears throat> And it started off just being like a couple normal ones about being James Bond or Sherlock Holmes. No, I'm going to trust you. You remember okay. James Bond. And then it slowly becomes clear that like he's like sexually attracted to his car and he starts having sex with his car. And then he's a vampire. <laughs> it's all just like, you know, random kind of stuff. But like <clears throat> it had a flow to it, I guess. I don't know. It's early days. So it's just it, experimenting. But that because... I've never, when you told me that that was what you submitted to get into NYU, my head fucking blew Right, off. like, you could do that? I had yeah. no idea. It's kind of ballsy. Like, what was, did you ever think, like, yo, this is crazy. I'm sending in two samples that are just so avant-garde. Like, I thought if they're, this is what I want to do there, and I'm pretty happy where I am, so if I don't get in, it's fine. Like, yeah. I was having a blast at Santa Cruz. Yeah, yeah. And I had so many friends there, and, um... <clears throat> And so I was like, I mean, the reason I would want to go to Tish is to make a bunch of comedy stuff. So I might as well show them. Like, there was no other ideas I had that were like, well, right. I could do that really good dramatic idea, or I could do this fucking weird diary entries thing and the rap. It, it was, it was all I had at top of my mind. You know, I, I hope this gets around to the person who read your NYU sample, because I would love to meet them. <laughs> the person who was just like, this guy, he, he fucking like, he sent in a cassette tape of a rap. Yeah. Not professionally recorded. And the diaries was a fucking... It's, it, but to me, I'm still like, oh, it's kind of brilliant. I was like, it's, it's a really cool idea. Thanks. I mean, I again, I want to say like, oh, I knew how to do it. I was just like, that was the only thoughts I had. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't calculated at all. It was like, I want to make dumb stuff, so I'm going to send some dumb stuff. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember being shocked when I found out that I got in. D uh, tell me about it. Was your, were your parents also shocked? I think they were. I mean, I've I've talked about this before and not in a bad way and in a way that was warranted. My parents were definitely worried that I they were like, he's a great, happy person, but um, he's not like a focused person who is going to do anything with his life. Right. Was sort of how they viewed me. Because you never told them that you were interested in doing uh, comedy professionally or anything. No, I did. I would be like, I want to be on SNL. And they were like, cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like so does every other teenager on Earth. Right. Um, but they always said it was after I got into Tish where they were like, oh, maybe he will do something. Because all of a sudden I went from like not caring about anything. Right. 
academic to like grinding. Right. And, and, and so, so when you got to NYU, uh, I've seen this in your life a few times and I, I want to get to it, but it, <laughs> you, I remember you being uh, super laser focused, even though you were fun and silly, when it came to the work, you were always so focused on that, right? Like crazy focused in a way that I was like, Oh shit, like nothing else matters. Like it's just what is going on that screen. Right. I mean, I would argue that some of my worst moments socially were during when I was directing, you know, directing yeah, yeah. stuff at NYU. That was when I decided I didn't really want to direct. Because yeah. I was like, I would be too in it. And when a lot of the people performing in the stuff I was making were not actors, they were just friends. Right. And I had a way that I wanted it to be in my head. And For I'd be like, sure. no, you're not saying it funny. And they'd be like, dude, I'm here. Like, I had a friend fly out from the bay. And I, I was, like, yelling at him in front of all these, like, kids in my class. And he was like, bro, fucking chill out. And I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just I really want it to be good. Because it's like. You were really focused. Yeah. And also at that age, it's like, if this isn't good, then I might not be able to do it. It was a you lot. Know? Of, it was like, a, you put a lot of pressure on, on all those uh, yes. videos. Yeah. Yes. But, I, I mean, you know, and oftentimes, and the thing you learn more and more, the more you do stuff. Sometimes the one that you stress out the most on doesn't turn out good. And right. the one that you don't even really think about too much ends up being great. And you're like, oh, right. Great. I should have just been relaxed for all of this. <laughs> right. But but yeah, it, it felt kind of urgent. Also, like my parents were not shy about being like, this is really expensive. <laughs> like, don't fuck around. You know, that, right. that was part of it. I was working part time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And. I, they were like, you could, you would not have been able to do four years of this. You had to transfer in. Yeah. You know, back then, especially going to a UC coming from California no. was way cheaper. Crazy. Like and then grand. going to NYU all of a sudden. And then, you know, you know, as be, as well as anyone, because we were roommates our senior year, the, the rent was just fucking insane. It was crazy. It was 2000 a month. For college kids. Was, you know what was... I mean? Where you're like, what? And then you get in it and it's just a dump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's, there is something to your parents being like, don't fuck around. This is costing us money. Like it they, does make it, it feel different. It does, right? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not going there to bullshit. My dad would say a lot. My dad would say your grandfather's rolling in his grave about money stuff. Gotcha. If like if you do something irresponsible with money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, oh, it's rough. It is, and it's still in me. Yeah, for sure. Where I always am like, the thing that I started applying to more after we got SNL and I started getting offered stuff that I really had to work on was saying no to things. Cause they'd be like, hey, we'll give you this money if you do blank. And I'll be like, I don't wanna do that, but that's that's real money. Yeah. You know, like saying no to legit money every time I feel weird guilt. Especially, I mean, especially when I've, having not been offered anything uh, or very yes. little. Yes, <laughs> yeah, for the first few years of it when that started happening. Yeah. I mean, I used to do like college shows on Sundays after SNLs. Oh, I didn't know that. You like fly to a college and do like a Q and A and show clips and stuff. Yeah. And I'd be like, I don't want to do that, but they'd pay you pretty good. Right. You know, we're talking like money. Yeah. And at SNL in the beginning, they're not paying you a ton. Right. For what it is. Yeah. Um. So I mean, Seth Meyers still is. He's got his own show, and he's still like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go do these stand-up shows and blah, blah, blah. Like there's, wow. I think comedians especially have this weird thing of like, I got to keep it. It's like the Jay Leno thing, right? Right, right. Like right, where right. everyone's like, we all know you're rich, Jay Leno. And he'd be like, yeah, I just want to you know, keep doing stand-up. <laughs> right, right, right. Just so I have something to fall back on. And they're like, you're set forever, like for 10 lifetimes. But like, it's a mentality that you can't really ever shake, I think. I remember reading a thing like at the height of his success with uh, Will Ferrell being like i feel like i'm just waiting for everyone to realize i'm a fraud oh my and i was like oh i'm never gonna be <laughs> yeah. if he still feels that way right like i'm never gonna be on solid ground internally you have to keep working right especially because you look you know at, at people coming up and you're like fuck there's people that are good yeah where i'm laughing and i'm like that's new and that's good yeah I'm like shit what am i gonna do <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know and it's on the, on the one hand, it's just exciting and cool and fun to be like, oh, man, like something made me laugh. Yes. Like what a dream right, that right, it's right. still happening. It can still happen for me that I watch comedy and laugh. Even like a movie that's not a comedy or something or a song even. I'll be like, oh, that's a well-crafted song. Right. 
And yeah, I'm like, yeah. but it doesn't affect me the same way because I've just we're just a little older and we've seen so much that you know everything about the history of how it got to that song right, right, or that right. movie or whatever. You're like, oh yeah, they're doing so and so and so and so, and they mix it together. <laughs> and you're you've lost that thing you had when you're a kid or a teenager yeah. where you're like. You could see something that is borrowing from 20 things you don't know about and be like, this is my shit. Right. Like, what is this new incredible thing? For sure. Um, and that happens every generation. Uh, Method Man was on Drink Champs talking about, he's breaking down the song Method Man. Mm -hmm. like, I wrote that when I was 16. Yeah. He, and he takes each part of Method Man and goes, I stole this from the Beatles. This part I stole from the Beatles. This part I stole from another song. Yeah. And he was like, I was 16. He was like, I was just doing my, I took that and I was making it my own, my own <clears> way. And I was like, wow. Oh my God, which part did he steal from the Beatles? I got black magic stuff. Oh yeah. I got, uh, he's like, that's from the Beatles. Mr. Meth. Mr. Meth, AKA Clifford Smith. <laughs> you see, gotta get him on here. See the Smith on the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, so you get into NYU, we're shooting shorts um it was a lot by the way because we were it's a thing we always wanted to do right and now all of a sudden you're thrown into this thing where you're like oh i'm a writer actor and director shooting and i've never done all of those things where i have a crew behind me yes. i have gaffers i have sound people yeah. working with you it's a lot it's a lot to learn yes did you ever feel like you found your footing any time at nyu I think the one of the cool things I learned there was that I had to let go. Like in the beginning, I was trying to micromanage every part of it. I always tell this story. Um, <clears throat> it's hilarious because now she's one of the most successful <laughs> DPs of all time. DP slash director. <clears throat> and director, yeah. yeah. Rachel Morrison was in our class. Yes. And went on to DP Black Panther, et cetera. And she was like, you're in groups and each – each group you're like okay this project they're the dp you're shooting you're this blah 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 and she was supposed to shoot mine and i was like I i'll just do it and like took the camera and didn't let her do it oh because i was because i was like i know how i want the shots to be and i'm not i don't have enough language to explain to you how i want it basically because yeah. i was panicked yeah yeah you know i was like and i gotta get all these shots and we don't have time and blah blah, blah. and then it looked horrible like it just looked like dog shit and then I saw her project that she shot, and I was like, oh, she's like a genius. <laughs> like, but I didn't know that yet. I no, was just no, being no. like anal and, and micromanaging in yeah, general. Yeah. And it, it, you have to go through those experiences and be wrong, baldly wrong, because you're also just young and worried and stressed and like yeah. you want it to be a certain way. I always talk about how things always go the worst when people have preconceived ideas of what it's going to be before they arrive at something. Right. And I was definitely guilty of that a lot of like, so it's going to be like this and I'm going to make it like this and blah, blah, blah. And then I would show up and it wouldn't go the way I wanted it at all. And the more I learned to trust people around me that were talented and let them do what they were good at, the better it made me. And I was like, right. the idea of like getting credit for work that a lot of people did was very foreign to me, honestly. Gotcha. That's something that I've sort of had to learn to deal with. I'm very... Yeah. I think because I'm like the youngest of three kids. Yeah. There's a lot of like, I did that. You did that. You know? Yes. So I'm always very quick to to give credit, but I also get prickly when I don't get it. You know? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and I think it was tied to that a little bit. But going through that process, I think I learned a lot. Right. To not worry about it so much. You know, I I don't think you weren't necessarily wrong in, how, in the specificity in what you wanted because you knew you knew you want even now with comedy it's like if a DP hasn't shot comedy you know and, and you want a shot a specific way you have to yeah. be able to communicate that yes and uh, so you weren't necessarily wrong you just didn't have the language skills to communicate with the DP at that moment correct if I had storyboarded it properly right. and then put my trust in a person who was much more talented than me it yes. would have been great for sure for sure and by the way it's why when when I linked back up with Kevin Yorm, yeah. I mean, the writing process of us together immediately was there. But in terms of like, like watching Keeve and then later Yorm work as a director yeah. was my first real experience working in the type of comedy I wanted to do of being like, oh, yeah. this dude knows exactly how to get it to be the way that I want it to be. Yeah, yeah. And gets the joke. For sure. Like, isn't just taking the joke that I'm doing and representing it, but he's improving it. Yes. And like being like, actually, I think you should cut sooner and like 
go to a wide here yeah. and oh let's bring the music up here and like things like that where i was like when i was editing i didn't have the patience <laughs> and so it would be like funny but really sloppy kind of right. like slapdash editing yeah and i just didn't have the like technical know-how like we learned avid yeah it was like i believe the first year nyu had ever gotten Avid. i believe right? so yeah i believe so and i was just like so excited that shot that shot that shot put on that song fade out and it's like a super slow fade out <laughs> or way too fast you yeah know? yeah yeah and keith was the person that i was like he was like no hang on and he would open up the fade out and he would take the thing and he'd be like, this is a better pace and you want it to fade out at this moment because there's a weird movement right here at the end of the fade out and it's super right. jarring. And I'd be like, oh, you can care about all that? <laughs> like, yeah. I just figured it was like, it wasn't up to people like us to be able to do those things well also. Right. I figured it was like, you just do what you do and then eventually if you do it well enough, people who are good at those things do them for you. Right. And he was like, no, we make it good. Yes. And I was like, ah. I mean, it kind of changed all of us because there are still people who have that mentality that you just said. Yes. Like, I'm going to leave that part to you to do. But, Absolutely. But you're, you are you are so specific, and and, the, and 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 actually, we all are now. You know, if we yes. see something, we go, nah, cut that sooner. Yes, We exactly. all have that in us now. Yes, you so, can't get, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Is it hard for you to be just an actor on a project? Um... Because of everything you know. It depends. Yeah. Yes, generally yes. But first off, I don't do that a lot, and I don't get asked to do that a lot. What, to be an actor? To just be an actor oh. on something. Like, usually things I'm doing are things that I've had some hand in creatively. Um, but, you know, I just did this movie, Lee, with Kate Winslet. Right. That's a full-on drama, mm -hmm. and I'm just an actor fully. Right. And... The reason that I was like, I'm going to do that is because it was Kate Winslet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Where I was like, I'm never going to get this chance again. She's one of the greatest actors, period, ever. And I thought I could do the part. But it was weird showing up on set and being like, tell me what to do. Like, it's been a while since I had that experience. Because even on Brooklyn, it was like, we had an incredible writing staff, but I was still a producer on it, and I still would give notes on scripts and notes on edits and, you know, me and Dan Gore would be walking and talking and talking about what the show could be and couldn't be and, you know, all kinds of stuff. I was creatively very involved, especially yeah. as it went on. Yeah. And I had done, what, eight years of that? Yeah. And then during that time we did, like, Pop Star and Seven Days in Hell. Those were all things that were our projects. Right. So um, it was different and it was in some ways really freeing and in some ways being like, Oh man, I hope they take care of me. <laughs> when you at when you watched the cut of Lee, did you have were you afraid to give notes of like oh get out of that scene quicker? Or did, yeah, I didn't really do that. Did you feel like did you feel like for you you really wanted to say something but you couldn't? Well, you know what? No, I it wasn't really like I don't think that would have been appropriate necessarily. Gotcha. Like, it wasn't really my place. I was I became very friendly with. Kate and uh, this other woman, Kate Solomon, who's one of the main producers. And we had this creative discussions about it. Like they would be like, we're thinking this, we're thinking that. And I'd be like, I think that. But it was never like, it's just different than the other stuff. It's their, I, that's their project, right. you know? And you have to stay aware of that because when it's the other way around right? and someone's giving me notes on my thing that I didn't ask for, I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right, right. Like right. I put in years of work to get this yes. to be this project. On the other hand, you should never shut yourself off. Like a million times someone's been like, I actually think blank and you have to be stay open to that to be like, Oh fuck, that's a good idea. Yes. Like it's the thing we were just talking about yeah, of yeah, what yeah, we yeah. learned at Tish is like everyone who has a good idea is a good idea. Like it doesn't matter who they are, what department you know, it could yeah. be your mom. It could be some random person at a screening. If someone's like, I actually thought this, if it resonates with you, you have to keep your creative like heart open to that. That's true. Because in the end, if it's better, it's just better. And that's just better for you. That's true. That's true. And and then do you think some of that is uh, when, you, when you fight those things, that's is that ego? Yes. I mean, the number of times I've been like, who are you? Who the fuck are you telling me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> the immediate response is the yeah you, you you immediately recoil because yes. you put so much of your time and energy and sure. 
you know, and we're also like, we don't know who, what your references are. I don't know, you know, yes. what, what you like, because then your notes are, are invalid to yes, my, yes. so there's a bunch of things. And there's plenty of times when you've made some, like we've made stuff over the years and showed it to people and they were like, that doesn't work. You got to get rid of this. Da, 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 da. And then it ends up that people love it. Right. And we don't change those things and we stick to our guns. You know what I mean? And we're like, yeah, oh, yeah. it's just that person didn't like it. Right. And that's just, that's how it works. Like exactly. no one likes everything. Exactly. Um, exactly. So you have to be open, but also like know what you want something to be going into it. So you don't end up you kind of at sea. Right, right, right. I um, mean, should we talk about that? I was really annoying for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I want to, <laughs> for who? For for teachers or friends? I think both. I think there were a f there were a few years there where I was like so like desperate to be seen and sure. to be thought of as funny and to do comedy that I would just do whatever. At L in L A or is this in New York? I would say uh, towards the end at NYU and in the beginning years in L A too. Yeah. Okay. I used to. Be, especially when we would start drinking I would just be like just goofy shit you know what yeah, I mean yeah, nothing yeah. harmful but like just obnoxious like I just wouldn't shut the fuck up yeah because I wanted it so bad I wanted everyone everywhere we went to laugh yep and that was not always the case <laughs> <laughs> I do remember this is I don't know if you remember this you and Keith I was at a party with you and Keith we went to some party in a very rich area and 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 we started walking in and it was almost like the version of like an MC battle. Uh huh. Do you remember this? And you you guys would go to try to find the funniest guys and out funny them. Really? Yes. That I don't recall. And I was and then you'd walk away and be like, These guys aren't funny. <laughs> and I was like, How do you know? I don't know. What proved that? <laughs> I have no recollection of that, but I love it. It was very funny. It was you and Keith, and you guys were just finding a sink of like your comedy and yeah, just yeah. doing it and out and trying to out funny these guys. It was wow. very funny. Huh. Yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised to hear it based on yeah. what I was just saying. It was we were we were psycho. You know, we would work yeah. like we had odd jobs and then at night and on weekends we were just writing and shooting. So we we moved out to LA together. What was the uh what was the immediate goal for you guys? Um I mean, it wasn't, it was, it kind of was happenstance. I don't know if the other guys talked about this, but me, Keith, and Yorm had gone to high school together and we're friends and we bumped into each other. I bumped into Yorm randomly in, uh, in Berkeley on College Avenue when I was home. And we were just like, we should catch up. We should, da -da. we should, you know, he was like, oh, me and Keith have been doing videos. And obviously, you know, I had stayed seeing Keeve here and there at Santa Cruz and right. basically we started hanging out again and talking about it and we're like the three of us should work together because we all want to do the same thing and I mean at that time I was like Yorm is a really good actor and he's super funny and uh, I mean I still think that <laughs> <laughs> at that time I was I guess I more mean like in compared to myself I was like Yorm's like knows what the fuck he's doing yeah um which was the case, you know, me and Keeve from the acting side of it, were just kind of flailing and doing things like trying things we thought were funny yeah. and we were funny, yeah, yeah. but Yorm could actually like he had a process and stuff and he was great in Keeve's stuff and Keeve, you know, Keeve's, Keeve's student films were much less scattershot. They were much more controlled. Yeah. And mine had maybe bigger swings yes. and so more misses, but maybe bigger laughs at times. Uh -huh. And we were like, we should smush what we got together. Like it was very deliberate. Oh, interesting. Um, and then, so we decided we were like, either we should try to get a place in Berkeley, so we're close to our families, and like make stuff, and then see if we can build up a catalog of things enough to then try and do LA, or should we just move to LA and go for it? Oh, I didn't know that. And we were like, if we move to LA now, we'll struggle more in the beginning because we're gonna have to work jobs we don't like and pay rent more and um but we just went for it yorm had already been living down there so me and keith right. went down and stayed at his little like studio apartment and looked for a place we right. found we found the original lonely island house yeah and that was it you know uh, we were doing temp jobs for a while i worked the night shift at a, a post coloring house called company three which I is still uh, a, a successful 
business. I, um, I remember you telling me a great story of working the night shift at that color correction place uh, that Hype Williams came in to color correct the music video. Yeah. Do you remember which video it was? No, which one was it? I, I don't remember. Oh, God, I thought you were going to tell me. No, I, I, <laughs> wish you, I wish you remembered. But you remember, I remember you going, I walked into the bay and it just smelled like weed smoke. And I was like, you could do that? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. It's like, if you're making shit that good, yeah. you can do whatever you want, apparently. And, he was, and that was the height of Hype Williams. That was oh, 2000. Yeah. I remember cool people would come in there and I would be like, they'd be like, hey, Andy, bring in like the reels. Because I was, you know, it was mostly just data entry of film reels it yeah. was still all film but then they would digitize it and do the you know the di yeah. not to be confused with ditc go back really quick though i, I with the keeve when i spoke to keeve i i mentioned this because I, I remember this not necessarily not necessarily being an issue but i remember it being uh it, it, it was a conversation which was that key stuff I remember Keith stuff being like you said it was controlled it was timed it was all intentional yeah he didn't take big swings it was all you know it was it was all very calculated whereas the stuff that you shot in NYU was just huge right it was bonkers so I when, mean yeah I wanted to be Jim Carrey and Sandler and Farrell absolutely yeah. absolutely and I and and when you guys started working together I asked Keith if was there ever a compromise in style yeah um do you remember any conversations happening or anything like that while you were shooting of like oh we're not gonna we're not gonna agree on this sometimes yeah. but the cool thing about i mean we were shooting with mostly the three of us and yeah. then when you moved there too we we started shooting with you more and yeah. we had other friends we shot with yeah but generally speaking if you have a group that's three or more we quickly just adopted the rule of like if it's two out of three then we're we'll do it and that served us really well and still does. Yeah. Like there's certain things we've done where one of us was like, I don't really get this. But two of us would be really excited about it. Yeah. And so the rule, we had an active like spoken rule, like if two out of three want to do it, then it's happening. Gotcha. And that helped, has helped so many times. There's so many times one of us didn't get it and the other two did. And then later they were like, yeah, it was great. I just didn't get it. I wasn't there for the inception of it, or I just yeah. didn't see it. Right. But you two guys did see it, and now I'm so glad it exists, and I get to be a part of it. You know, even that, though I didn't get it, like it. It's the most democratic process. Yes. And and you can't you can't be mad about that. You know. No. And and it works out a lot of the yeah. time. Yeah. Sometimes it's even two out of three don't like something, and one's like, "Well, I'm going to do it anyway." And I would say almost every time it's like, "Yeah, it's not good enough." Yeah, 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 yeah. But for whatever reason, the two out of three thing has always worked really well. Uh, you know what I remember? I remember that during that time we all lived together, you had a really good worth work ethic as far as actually maintaining a nine to five job. <laughs> right. Akiva did not have a job. No, he just went into debt. Yeah, I I would get my PA jobs, and then th <laughs> there was a gap where I didn't I didn't work because I just was like, oh, I just want to not work yeah, for a minute yeah. and write and whatever. But you you I felt like you always maintained something. Is that also from your dad? I don't know. I think I maybe was fearful that I, if I wasn't earning money, that I was going to be in trouble. Mm. Uh, whereas Keeve was just confident. He was like, no, I'll just go into debt. It'll be like, you know, what's the worst it could be? Like 10 grand after a few years? It went 20, I think. 20, and then we got SNL. I mean, yeah. he was so right. He was right. I'm, I'm still mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> he was just kicking it. I remember we would go visit you at uh, Ubu, Ubu mm -hmm. Productions. That's right. And it, it would make you furious. Oh, yeah. I was like, this guy's just doing it. Just... But he never had that. He's always had a different level of like, yeah, it'll be fine. Right. And I'm, I'm sure it's a family thing. For sure. It just comes. I don't know where that confidence comes from. And maybe it's just the confidence in himself where he just knows he's smart and going to figure it out. Whereas for me, I'm just like. I don't know. It might it might could be a disaster. <laughs> did you did you have any doubt that it would not work out? All the time. Really? Yeah. I didn't know this. All the time. I mean, I, once we got down there and started making stuff and I started doing stand up. Yes. And I sort of started getting the lay of the land. I was like Stand up was interesting. We've had this conversation a million times, but um when I would do stand up, some nights I would kill yeah but most nights 20 percent of the audience loved it yes and 
eighty percent was like, yeah, smiling. Yep. And I was like, so whatever it is that I like is not the broad thing. Mass appeal. Yeah, I don't show up and just be like, everyone loves this. It was too like meta and eating itself and like, yeah. you know, post Steve Martin's post, post, post. You right. know, right. Um, and which I didn't even realize, by the way. I mean, <laughs> explain for people who don't really know. It's, your stand-up was, was you would set people up. It was kind of just making fun of stand-up. Yeah, you would set people up with a premise, and you think that you're going to get the punchline, yes. and you don't give them the punchline at all. No, it would always end up being something weird. Yeah. And, by the way, that's even that now is so played out. Right. You know, at the time, it felt, like, edgy. Right, right, right. Um, cause everyone was trying to get a sitcom. So everyone was like right down the middle, like saying, so I'm single. Like after, after a joke was a real joke and I would do it sarcastically. Yes. That's right. That's and right. that was like, and you, Oh, that's funny because people really do that. And it's lame. You, 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 you'd lost 80% <laughs> of the audience at that point. <laughs> yes. yes. Like, why is this guy so loud? <laughs> <laughs> I was remembering no, this yesterday. Do you remember a bit I used to do where I would, it was just an old guy having sex. I vaguely. It was just like three minutes of just like. Ugh. Oh yes. Yeah yeah. Oh no! Like it was just there was no joke. It was just annoying. I I will say I think, uh, I I went to a lot of your bringer nights. Thank you. I appreciate that. Of course, at two drink minimum. Yep, a lot you, of money. You know how it goes. I think I probably owe you. No no no, I owe you. A thing. <laughs> uh, n um, I will say it for me. It didn't even matter the content I think some people were just looking like really focused in on this content but for me I, I, I told you this before it was your delivery and your presence on stage and your energy yeah that you couldn't stop looking at like even if you didn't like it you're like I can't stop looking at this guy <laughs> well, in the best nice. way possible yeah that's very flattering I mean I loved doing it because why because I had always wanted to I guess yeah like I, I remember I remember some guy the guy who used to run the bringer nights would tell you like, do you remember this? He'd be like, Andy, you, you take, we should take stand up more seriously. Yeah. And you were folk and you were focused on lonely Island videos. And I forgot right, what right. you said to him, but do you remember that? If it's the same thing I'm remembering, he would say, you always show up and do new material. That's not worked out, but you have a great 10 minutes. You should always do your best 10 minutes because you never know who's going to be there. Got it. Is that, is, is that the same time? It, it might've been, I remember that, but I, but by I, the way, even that over the next five years, like, there was like the Largo movement, quote unquote, right, right, that right. kind of wiped that away it's from true. stand up in true. general. And it, it at that time, it was like a very like, whoa, they just come up there with their notebook and try new stuff every night. And now I feel like that's very common. Yeah. And has been. Absolutely. For a while. Absolutely. But when I was doing it and I, I was chasing the Largo scene, basically, of like, gotcha. I got to I got to write a new joke, you know, at least one or two new things every time I perform. Right. And because otherwise I'll just have the same 10 minutes forever. I didn't want stand up to be my career. Got it. But it was an outlet. It was an outlet for performing your own stuff that you found fulfilling. Yes, and just getting confident and building a voice and a lot of my SNL auditions were my stand up. And I had that confidence and I had developed a bit of a stage presence because I had done that for 7 years on and off. Right. So it was very helpful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um what what was the big what was the big thing? I felt like Comedy Blend when you got asked to do the Comedy Central special. Oh, Premium Blend. Pre premium Blend. Sorry. Yeah, that's the the furthest I ever took stand up. Like being told like, hey, you're going to be doing comedy on television. Yeah, that was definitely the biggest thing that had happened for me. Absolutely. Yeah. And and were you at the? I mean, your your stand up set was pretty meta at the time too, right? Yes, but I only ended up doing like eight or nine minutes. Right. Do you remember how it went? Did it go good? It good. It was good. Yeah, it was so. I mean, I went to New York, and like, I was you know they put you in hair and makeup, and you're on stage, and you're filming, and you're in front of a huge crowd, and you know it's for TV. And, right. But just to have been able to have done it, and like, then have a clip on ComedyCentral.com. Yeah. Where you're like, hey, if anyone wants to know who I am, that's me. <laughs> like, <laughs> I exist. Right. You know, I've I've been in front of a real camera, basically. But we were still assistants. Like, Yorm was the writer's PA at Spin City, and I was working at Ubu yeah. when we got agents, right. based on all the stuff we had shot ourselves. Yeah. And she talked about that as well. Oh, did he? Yeah. And she was so nice to us. He said that he thought, 
you were adorably funny and Yoram was very funny and uh, the writer's assistant on the show would like go play video games while they were on break and he was like those he doesn't want it those guys want it. right right yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he said that it was great and, and that he's like he's like it wasn't even a, it wasn't even it wasn't even a question that you guys were going to do something oh, he's like wow. so he's like i just had to help that along he did he was a sweet guy yeah, yeah. man brooke they really they really Absolutely. helped us out they did not need to no um fallon has said similar things because when we got snl's because we wrote for jimmy on the mtv movie awards yeah to us we did not know it was an option to not be like working all the time right you know yeah <laughs> like we'd had this a little we would talk about this when we were still in film school where I, where people wouldn't finish their films oh that's right but i was always shocked and then I, I mean that was the beginning of me realizing like is it unique to be like i'm gonna keep working on this till it's done right <laughs> but I mean, over the years i have found that it is it is yeah yeah to be passionate enough to and have an interest enough in, yes. in your project still and I'll say now at like having, you know, a, a career to look back on a little bit and having friends who also do this, there are times where we talk about like, oh, there's not that many people that like won't stop till it's finished. Yeah. Especially now because there's so much opportunity to do like 15 things at once. Right, right, right. And there's a lot of there's a lot more of like, yeah, and it's pretty much there and like people just walk away. Yeah. And like and then the, someone else will finish it. Yeah. And you're just like, what? But how can you, in your heart, I know. let it go like that? It's like, to me, I'm like, I have a a connection to it. There's, there's something about spending so much time on something where you're like, this is what I chose to do with my life. Like, I want to make sure it at least represents what I was going for as best I can, you know? At this point, so after Premium Blend, what's your level of confidence and, and self-doubt? Do you, do, you, do you feel like you have a little wind behind your back now? A little bit, yeah. I would say... I had at least hit a moment where I was like, I can do comedy for a living eventually. I can go and audition for things and be like the funny person that shows up in something and like has a funny scene or, yes. you know, eventually be a touring stand up or something. Gotcha. You know, but never like a legit big one. Do you remember uh, while we were at NYU and even even when we lived in L.A., there, there was people that would just be like, Andy, he's going to be on SNL one day. Do you remember that? I remember I remember that ha it had been said to me before, yeah. And did that make you feel uncomfortable or did that give you confidence? No, it made me like rock hard. <laughs> I was like there were a few you got kids, it a lot. A few kids in our, our classes at school said that after I would show things and I'd be like, You think? <laughs> like it's all it, I mean, you remember it's all yeah. I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I just wanted SNL. That was my dream. That's all I wanted. And I knew it was never gonna happen. Yeah. And I even tried like doing Groundlings classes oh, I in LA because I was like, if you do Groundlings, you can get SNL. And I did the first like, you go in and like do a, a improv audition or whatever. And I remember I did so badly and I was so all over the place. And they like they're like, you go in our advanced one and you go in the lower one. And they put me in the lower one. Yeah. And I was like, fuck this. This is <laughs> this is not how I'm gonna do it. You know, like it's not for me. Yeah. I need to have it more like controlled where I write something ahead of time. I just knew that I didn't want to be improv. And by the way, to this day, I don't consider myself like an incredible imp improv person. Right. Like when we're shooting stuff, it's very infrequent that it's like, okay, now just do whatever. And I don't think about what I'm going to do before we do it. You know, like we'll do a ton of alts. Right. Or I'll think of, I mean, it's like when you're like in a freestyle circle and you're like, my first line is going to be this. <laughs> So you know you're going to come in with a good firstie. And then the second And, and then it falls to parts and they go, oh, my God, <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> got it, got it. But, like, I would never I would never be like, oh, I'm just on a roll and coming up with incredible shit. Like, that's a skill that I think a lot of people really have and are yeah. brilliant at, and I would never consider that to be what I was good at. So, gotcha. It, but, again – I was trying. Right. I was like, I'm going to go check out a Groundlings. Absolutely. And then I went and I was like, it's not that. Like, I can already tell I'm more comfortable doing this shit with Kevin Yorm and doing stand up. That's cool, man. So I don't think it's time for me to like pivot and put all my energy into this. Also, it's expensive. Right. And I was like, I'm going to have to pay all this money to start in their like lowest class. What did, uh, t talk a little bit about Awesome Town. I spoke to Keeve about this. I didn't speak to Yorm about it, but <laughs> when you guys got Awesome Town money, 
to shoot a pilot presentation. Phil Lord, Chris Miller were producers on it. Yeah. It was a huge deal. Yes. It was not a lot of money. What, what was it again? Was it 70? Uh, Keith would remember. I think he said something like 70. But okay. 70, 2004. I mean, compared to anything five. we had done before, it was a lot. It was, it was a lot. But and you soon yeah. realized it was not a lot after. Well, of course, as with all things with us, the stuff we shot that was expensive, we ended up not liking because we didn't, we weren't able to control it. Like they yeah. gave us all their stock people who made it look like all their other stuff. It was kind of your fear in college. Yes. <laughs> it came true. It came true. It just happened to be Rachel Morrison. who you were doing <laughs> Yes, I just blew it that, <laughs> that first time I was wrong. And so I'm scarred forever. Right, right, right. I'm sorry, Rachel. You're the greatest. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, you know, we, we did like in studio stuff and we shot yeah. on stages and some of it came out pretty good. But then we were like, we have more stuff we want to shoot. And we just went off and shot it on our own. The opening song, like right. we, we cut in this thing of Bjorn rapping in an alley that was the funniest part of the song. And it wasn't there before, you know, and those are things we all shot essentially for free. Yeah. Those days were like $100 yeah. for bagels to give to everybody. Yeah. Um. And we had been doing a lot of stuff like that because of Channel 101 and also shooting our own stuff. But, like, we knew we wanted there to be a music video. We knew we wanted sketches. And then at that time, they were like, we want you to do a thing where it's you in front of a live audience because everyone was just ripping off Chappelle. Yeah. That format became the format of every sketch show that came out after, after it yeah. for, like, five years. Um, yeah. And we did not want to do it that way because we were like, it's just another one of those. Yeah. So we wrote fake bits in that format, right? Yeah. Where it was like we brought out our moms and like the audience started chanting moms in this really psychotic, like big brother weird way. Um, <laughs> stuff like that, you yeah. know, and, and it ended up like being like kind of funny, kind of uncanny valley weirdness yeah. of like, it's not quite a show and it's not quite a sketch and we ended up, you know, they ended up not doing the show on Fox, mm -hmm. which we were not surprised. Mm -hmm. And then we recut it the way that we wanted without those things right. and just the sketches we thought were funny. Um, but were you, I, and I remember, I mean, Keith said that he wasn't even upset when Fox passed, but were you upset when Fox passed on it? I was expecting it. Yeah. Like when they gave us the deal, I was like, we're not, we don't make this tone. Right. Like I, we weren't stupid. We watched everything they put on. It was big, broad business and they had a lot of quality stuff, but none of it was like what we wanted to make. Gotcha. Um, so you weren't that upset about it. I mean, I was bummed, but not surprised. Right. Craziest thing about everyone passing on awesome town is we were like, we're fucked. That was our big shot. Gotcha. And we blew it or people didn't get it. And then we got SNL like, right after yeah and i i think premium blend was in there somewhere also uh the timing of it yes yeah like yeah. that year it I was, was like march april yes awesome town yeah yeah it was super like oh shit it might be happening and then it was like no and then right. immediately it was like yes <laughs> <laughs> but you know if it again you never are on solid ground but if you get one thing that feels legit to you, yeah, you start letting yourself believe you are at times. And then, you know, eventually you'll have another failure and you spin out and you have to work your way back from that. Like it, the, the, it's the most cliche thing about working in entertainment is like you're as good as the last thing you did. Right. And. Is that, is that, do you mean just, you mean possibly like job, job opportunities? Because, yeah. Right. And just like, I mean, it, the goalposts move, right? Right. Like it, after we got SNL and it went well, I have never thought I'll never work again, which before we got SNL, I thought all the time, you know, where I was like, I'm going to have to leave the business. Wow. At times. Did, th did you think that? I feel like he wouldn't allow you to think that. <laughs> he was still very confident. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't I probably not now that I say it. I don't right. think I ever thought I'm going to totally quit. Probably moments of being like this is not working. There's moments of like how difficult is it going to get? Right. You know, like 
I don't know. I was still enjoying it. I was still loving doing stand up and loving shooting stuff and loving writing with Keeve. Like, yeah. we were still like really grinding. Yeah. Me and Keeve had written like a few screenplays before we got SNL. I remember. And, you know, when we submitted a writing packet, we all wrote that and we had written everything we had shot. We had shot like 30 things maybe. Yeah. And then Channel 101 also, we had shot like 12 or 15 things for that maybe. Yeah. So we had done a lot of work yeah. considering, I mean, it's hilarious. Now that you're an adult and you have kids, you're like, yeah, we had nothing but free time. <laughs> right. But at the time I remember being like, we would pep talk each other and be like, everyone's out partying and we're working and it's going to be worth it. Like we'd literally say those wow. words and be like, sometimes we'll go out and we'll have fun. Yeah, but yeah. even those nights, you remember, we'd come home at like midnight after drinking out at parties or bars and then make songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how it started. Yeah. Because Matt had his, you know, digital eight track. Yeah, eight yeah. track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you might be right. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it was four. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> so wait. So so let's talk really quick about because I talked to you. Uh, I spoke to Yorm uh, about uh, when you get the SNL uh, SNL audition. Did you feel prepared for that audition? Not entirely. I knew I had stand up and then Keevan Yorm helped me write a bunch of stuff. Right. Oh, like, there, was new, there was new stuff added to it. A ton. Yeah. Both. I, then they asked me to audition a second time also. Right. Which at first they said, just come redo the stuff you did the first time. And then like three days or two days before I got a sneaky call from them being like, actually do new stuff. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> so did was it a whole, all new stuff? Yes. Pretty much. Do you remember which ones? Both times I did Fallon. Jimmy Fallon at a funeral. <clears throat> hey, hey, what's going on, my man? All right. Boy, this funeral's so sad, huh? It's so sad. Hey, by the way, for the occasion, I got you a sweet gift basket. It's got like four kinds of meats. It's fantastic. All right. Jimmy Fallon. Which I knew that I had a funny one because I used to, when we wrote for him on the movie words, I did it as the temp for the animatics of the, the, the films. Uh-huh. And he watched them, and he's like, who's that dude in my voice? I love that. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, he sounds just like me. <laughs> um, so I knew that I would do that, and I know he had auditioned by doing Sandler. So I was like, you know. Yeah. It was very like, eh, yeah, you know, I could be that, uh -huh. you know. Um, and he had recommended us and recommended me from the nice experience we had had working with him on the Movie Awards. Mm -hmm. So I knew there was, like, connectivity yeah. in doing him. And then the other ones were like, Again, it was like taking sort of the piss out of the idea of it entirely. Like I did Alan Rickman, but I only said the word McLean. Mr. McLean. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I was like, I can't do Alan Rickman. Right. So it should be like, McLean. Oh, thank you very much. You know, and the joke was that it was not much. The first or the second time, I think I did Billy Bob Thornton talking about Kangles. I'm Billy Bob Thornton, and welcome to Billy Bob Thornton's show about Kangles. Kangles are, of course, the brand of hat that I adore so much, and this is the only show that explores all facets of the Kangol lifestyle. The first thing I'm going to do today on the show is call my good friend Samuel L. Jackson and ask him what kind of Kangol he's wearing. Which was something that, like, I had never even tried before they asked me to audition. Gotcha. And I was just like, okay. I did The Swedish Chef, which was just nonsense. This is <clears throat> The Swedish Chef from The Muppet Show sings the hits. You give love a bad name by Bon Jovi. <clears throat> smorgy smorg, this smorg 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 this smorg 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 smorg. Give it away by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Smorgy smorg smorgy smorg smorgy smorg smorg smorgy smorg smorgy smorg smorgy smorg 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 smorg. Time after time by Cindy Lauper. Smorgy smorg smorgy smorg smorgy smorg smorg smorg. Smorg, borg, de borg. Do you remember getting any laughs during your audition? Yes. Do you remember who, from who? Tina laughed. I mean, I think she probably was a good laugher because she had been through it and wanted to make people feel comfortable. Uh -huh. But I didn't know that. So when I heard her laughing, I was like, oh, shit, that's Tina. Like, that's fucking Tina Fey just laughed at my joke. And it definitely gave me confidence. I'll say this. When I first got asked to do it, I was like, this is the, the moment of my life. I definitely knew it was... Because, I mean, 
there was no confusion. It wasn't like, oh shit, I never thought about this. It was like, this is all I've thought about since I was eight. Yeah. So I assumed I wouldn't get it. The first time? Beforehand. Yeah. I was like, I'm sure I won't get it, but I'm going to get to try. And that's so crazy, you know? And then after the first one, I did get feedback like, they liked you. And I was like, okay. (laughs) Once I heard that, I was like, oh, I'm going to fucking get it. Wow. Not that I thought I was going to, but like, I am going to do whatever I can, you know? Um, to it's that feeling like to have it like so close, you know. I, I feel so horrible for people that auditioned and did well and didn't get it. Right. There's so many funny people, so many people that are so much funnier than me that have auditioned for SNL and didn't get it because for whatever reason they're and like, well, this year they weren't right sure. for what we needed or whatever. And have done well in their careers. It's, yes, yeah, yes. Absolutely. Many have gone on to be a lot more successful than a lot of SNL cast yeah. members. Um, but I know for most people in comedy especially if you end up auditioning for snl it's because you love snl and you want to be on snl so it's i can't imagine how painful it would have been for me to have gotten that close and not gotten it Uh but i don't know maybe it's because jimmy was recommending us or something but i just felt way more comfortable than i thought i was going to right like i was nervous i threw up like the day of my first audition yeah. was I because it was like this is it this is it you know my brain was going crazy sure sure but once I was there I was like I know what this is I've watched fucking every SNL you know right. and I know what I can do and I'm just going to do what I do and that's all I can do I can't make it suddenly be that I'm like a master impressionist or right, someone right. who has developed a character for five years yeah so I just had as much fun with it as I could and then they asked me to do the second one and Yorm came and, and auditioned that time as well. Yeah. And Keith had a writer's meeting and we put together our writing packet for the three of us together. But I will say the fact that they asked me back and they asked Keith and Yorm right. and they asked for our packet and we had become friendly with them through working with Jimmy and we were friendly with Forte. I was like, we feel like we're right there, you know? Right. Like Forte helped me with my audition. Yeah. He's just so sweet. Very he was sweet. already on the show. He was on the show. Yeah. Like him and his buddies, his buddy Dave, like helped me record like jingles for the audition and shit. And like they watched me do it at a stand up place and gave me notes. Like it's just so nice. It felt like a lot of people were rooting for us, which you don't often get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I said before, Jimmy, like we stayed up all night shooting those MTV Movie Awards videos like the the film parodies where we like put him into the movies from that year yeah and he's told us multiple times later like after the fact like you guys just were like there pitching jokes to like th- four in the morning and i was like oh they want it and we were like we felt like we were getting to do that <laughs> like we were on a huge s- stage uh, at universal like shooting like yeah. a batman parody and right. like star wars parodies like for us it was like fuck yeah this is a huge shot you know yeah, yeah, like yeah. how cool that we get to do this but for him, he was like, "Not yeah, that's not how people are." You once said to me that um, your your biggest dream was to get on SNL, and everything else after was just gravy. Right. Yes. Do you, you still feel like that? Yes, I forget it all the time, but I try to remind myself because it's true. Yeah. Like, I can't go back there now, so I have to do something. <laughs> <laughs>